Now we'll be talking about how KMS can be used to uh, QC both your data sets, like the, your read data sets and your assemblies. So I, I will first give you a, one example from bees, and then I will give the word to Ruthia, who will tell you about what, what's the species you, well, she will tell you. So the, the huge advantage of KMS is that you don't really have to assume much. Like if you just plot the KMS histogram, you you just plotted it right that's your data like it's sort of like a garbage in garbage out system like you cannot fake the camera spectra it's a <laughs> uh so if, if you have any types of like big problems like uh, for example you accidentally amplified lots of errors in you uh, using pcr steps you will see it in the camera spectra if your whole genome amplification did have like very different coverages for different regions of the genomes you will see it in camera spectra so it's like a very good routinely check of all the data you have because it just gives you a lot of information. You can also quite often spot their contamination and sort of make sense of things like uh, genome size estimations. And like it's overall, it's just a very easy thing to do. Well, Camille, mm -hmm. there's a, some questions in the uh, chat about how we haven't brought up the aneuploidy and different ploidy parameters. Uh, so, the, uh, this will be a bit tomorrow. So like we'll be looking at males that are technically aneuploids for X chromosomes. And we will be also talking about uh, genomes that have uh, like, the, the, I will show you the mixed library of, uh, uh, one, two, three, sorry, I started to read the second question for some reason. <laughs> So to, tomorrow we will look at the cases where we have a mixed library with different issues inside, but it will be part of the uh, tomorrow's blog today. day. And uh, knowing the ploidy of uh, examples, I can I can add that information somewhere. Um, so actually, in fact, for the older examples, I will probably give you, okay, I will give you the, like the genome scope command I use in the end as the model I was happy with or the most happiest with. Um, so the QC example I want to show you is uh, on this uh, Cape honeybee because that's an interesting system because uh, Cape honeybees, if they have this like one mutation, the, the workers will start laying diploid eggs and they will just develop in more workers that are again laying eggs because this is a, a clonal inheritance. It's not perfectly clonal. The, the daughters do not have exactly the same genotypes as mothers. They're supposedly doing something that's called central fusion automixes, which means practically speaking that the, the daughter is some sort of recombination combination of its mother's genotype. So there will be always a small lot of loss of heterozygosity, but not necessarily very big. So because if there the are only a little of recombination or if the recombination occurs only in, in uh, places that are very distant from centromere, then uh, the, the heterozygosity can be maintained. So they, they found these three lineages that, that were running for at least 20 years. And uh, they wanted to measure the heterozygosity. And then they had the, the three lineages, they sequenced, and they mapped back to reference and they were visualizing on different chromosomes the heterozygous loss. And they, they found that it, it varies a lot between lineages, which was like first shocker. We thought that this recombination uh, locations will be quite conserved. And second, there are big chromosomes where the heterozygous is actually th throughout conserved. And uh, Honestly, I didn't care about this that much. What I what because they are asexual, I just just wanted to catalog them and just estimate the heterozygosity as a number. So I started genome profiling these species, and I found like the lineage A and C have like actually embarrassingly uh, precise estimates of the genome size. Like this is uh, the genome size of a hun uh, honeybee is like two three six, and in both cases I'm within two max range from the uh, like uh, the reference genome of uh, uh, honeybee. And the models actually look quite all right. There is like a bit of misfit, but like it's all within the range of what we could expect. 
And uh, I also managed to have quite conserved estimates of heterozygosity. So both samples have about the same heterozygosity, which is actually quite remarkable that the heterozygosity loss in the Cape honeybee was in the both lineages the same. But when we look at the third lineage, it's this kind of hot mess we're looking at. The, the genome size is 100 megs lower than what we would expect. And this is a small arthropod, so sort of where it could have gone. And the heterozygosity is also estimated to be a bit high. But the question is, is this really what we're looking at? Like why there is such a uh, big error peak? So I tried to, to investigate and I went uh, like back to the sequencing library and just tried to figure like, uh, what's the really the, the, the maximal genome size that can be given the sequencing library. And I look at the paper and I found what's their sequencing coverage. And they said it was 69X, which means that like when they mapped the reads back to the reference, the average size of a stack was 69X. So then I divided the, the, the size of the, uh, the library by this uh, 69X and then it gave me 195, which is like the maximum possible estimate of genome size, given what they say about the genome genome coverage, which is still missing at least like 30 max of the genome or 40. So uh, the, the thing is with this library, it's so messed up that I, and I don't know what exactly they've gone wrong, but it is just missing pieces of the honeybee genome. So any kind of biological inference on this genome will be completely wrong. Like the, if they, they were like missing regions, like how can they like say what exactly have happened? Like if they don't understand the error pattern. So I felt like, like if they would do a just simple check at the very beginning of like, what's the quality of their data, they would know that the sample B just sucks. And that's why in this graph, when they were comparing A, B, C, the B was so different everywhere. It has nothing to do with the biology of the species. So this was just a quick example of the honeybees. And now, would you like to start your own presentation or should I just move your slide with you? I think it, it'll be quicker because you'll take over in a like okay. a, again. So it'll be quicker if I just then just talk. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So um, another example of how uh, Chimera Spectra can help us uh, QCing our libraries. Uh, this is a sample from uh, my PhD project, and I, as an anecdote, I would say this is the second time I sequenced this species because the first time. Um, the species was had been misidentified in the botanical garden, so I basically sequenced the wrong thing uh, in the first time, and then I realized, and then I went for the real species, and I sequenced this. Um, and uh, it's quite clear, it was quite clear to me since the beginning that I was just not dealing with a highly heterozygous species, because as you can see, uh, the peak, um, yeah, you're, you're anticipating uh, to, to my question, uh, the, the question you just posted on the chat, uh, it'll be basically in the next uh, the next slide. Um, but uh, basically, yeah, you realize that you have a peak there that is not half of your of your coverage, which means it's likely not to be um, a heterozygosity peak, and um, it seems to be quite co uh, I mean quite high coverage, not not such high coverage, but um, but big enough to be detected on the on the camera spectra. So um, um, I was kind of wondering whether what had I, what did I sequence together with my plant? Um, oh, sorry, past the slide. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah. So then I went back to the pot, and and this is a plant I was not familiar with. Um, so and I collected and harvested the material for sequencing in two different seasons. Um, and the plant looked slightly different when I went on the second time, but I didn't worry because it was just the summer. So I just thought it looked much happier. Uh, but then I realized in the same pot, there were two things that may be different growing at the same time. So I don't know if you can see from there, but um, the one uh, plant at the back had smaller leaves. Um, that was basically the only trait I could sort of di distinguish between one and the other, but I thought maybe these are two different things. Uh, sorry, next thing. Um, then I, I fished out some plastic reeds and I tried to blast them to see. Um, so luckily we had some, some marker uh, sequenced for, for this species. So I could actually tell whether I had only this begonia johnsonii or something else as well. And I seemed to be two different things there. Uh, I ran a quick assembly 
just to see. And I ran block, block plots as well, block tools. I highly recommend block tools uh, for just removing any contaminants, not only you know, stuff you can see on your <clears throat> camera spectra, but um, you know, small bacteria, <clears throat> sorry, contics and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, as you can see on the block plot, um, so I mean, for whoever's not familiar with the block plot, what you do here, some uh, people have mentioned it before, but what you do here is you take your assembly or a draft assembly, and then you map your reads back to it. Uh, and uh, you also uh, blast uh, or get blast hits of all your contacts. So you get um, a plot that tells you uh, which of um, how much coverage you, of your reads you have for um, your contacts, as well as what kind of hits you get um, uh, from your NCBI uh, database. So um, it's very small, but uh, the blue um, the blue uh, colors uh, here are for Streptophyta, which is uh, plants and uh, no heat. And then what you can see very clearly here, this is the coverage axis, is that you have two different peaks of different coverage. So it's exactly, exactly the same thing that you saw in the claim spectra. We just sequence two things that seem to be plants, but they are in different coverages. So I could separate them that way. Um, yeah, so that was lucky. Um, yeah, that's it. You can pass, yeah. Uh, and then the second example I wanted to talk about is basically um, when you don't have the right genome size estimate or your genome size estimate is off. And this is an example of the mistletoe. And at the beginning, um, and we, um, people weren't sure about the genome size of mistletoe. Um, and the estimate from um, closer relative species from the same family, can you pass the slide, Camille? was less than 10 gigabase pairs. So uh, the first run of sequencing from Fundamental was based on, uh, I think, uh, around a three gigabase pairs genome. Um, so that's that's the camera spectra we got from very, very low coverage, basically, because in the end, uh, all the mistletoe-related species are actually high, uh, larger, have a larger than 60 gigabase genome. So um, this is what you see when you don't have enough coverage for anything because everything overlaps with your sequencing errors. Um, so basically, yeah, if you don't have a good genome uh, size estimate, I mean, I mean, this is way off. So it's very difficult, <laughs> easy to identify, but it can also be um, something uh, to check with your chemist spectrum. Yeah. Okay, so uh, moving slightly uh, topics, we can also QC our assembly using chemists. Uh, using GAT, which is another, uh, it, uh, it's another software that also does KMR counts as KMC. Um, uh, and this is a, a function of GAT that is called the um, assembly spectra copy number plots. Um, and basically what you can do is plotting a representation of how many elements of the frequency of the reads or KMRs ended up not included in the assembly, included once or twice, etc. cetera. Uh, Surbi showed a few plots uh, on Herarpinia data with the, uh, on this, which were really cool. But I just wanted to start simple. This is uh, data from the, the uh, documentation from GAT. So you can actually have a look at the tutorials. They're really good. Uh, so the very first plot would be basically a haploid or highly homozygous genome. Um, uh, and uh, it would be coming from a really good assembly in which everything is in one single copy. So you haven't missed anything and you have assembled most of it, but you've avoided errors, which is the uh, bit that is in black. And then the second example would be a not so good assembly in which you've basically, so sometimes what we or people tend to do when you finish your assembly is to, for it to look prettier, you get rid of the smaller sequences, right? Like the context that you think don't have genes or are not useful. And that what, what can what that can result uh, on on is basically getting rid of a bunch of your low coverage gamer maybe that weren't that, uh, assembled that well, and that's why you have a massive chunk of of of, um, of your data missing on your genome, and that's what you can see on the second plot. Yeah, can you pass the slide? Yeah. So um, then, if we had, if we think of uh, heterozygous genomes. This gets, gets a bit trickier because with heterozygous genome, so basically sometimes, well, with the heterozygous loci, you have two different copies, right? Or two different things that you may assemble together or you may assemble separately. So in the first case, what you can see is um, um, 
what the best case scenario would be is that you have assembled everything once. So you will have assembled one time uh, all the um, homozygous um, sequences, basically by collapsing them together. And then you have um, also assembled the haplotypes different, like in different sequences, and then sort of collapse them into the first one or into one. So that's why you have half the haploid peak, sorry, monoploid peak. And, uh, and then you have all your, your homozygous um, cameras there. Uh, sorry, I, I'm not looking at the questions. Is there anything I should be? No, I think everything okay. is good. Okay, cool. Um, and then what um, can happen as well in heteros in assembly of heterozygous genomes is that instead of collapsing everything into one copy, you kind of get two copies of everything. So you get um, your two haplotypes separately. And in that case, <clears throat> yes, right, yeah. And in that case, what you would have is two copies of all the homozygous stuff and one copy of each of the alleles or of the or the haplotypes. And that's why what shows on the second plot. So basically two copies of the homozygous bit and one copy of each of your haplotypes. Yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, that's it's, it's a nice way to get in, started on these plots. But yeah, basically normally what you see on, um, on genomes are something like this when you plot them. <clears throat> so things are in different copies. Um, and that's what it, you know, normal genome assembly looks like. It's not too bad because you know you still have half the copies uh, removed from your heterozygosity peak, which means you've collapsed heterozygosity. Um, but you know you have several copies of a few things. Um, yeah, so uh, I've we've made a small tutorial of uh, running CAT uh, on a genome assembly. We've used the um, ZZ data that is already on the server. 